So 24% of Americans are evangelical Christians, and a stunning new book peels back the curtain on the movement's divisions, scandals, and deep ties to the conservative politics. Please welcome the author of that book, New York Times bestseller, The Kingdom, The Power, and The Glory, American Evangelicals in an Age of Extremism. <laughs> Tim Alberta. Yes. It's a mouthful. <laughs> but my God, the things, it is a spectacular book. It is just spectacular. Can you explain to people, because I, I don't think I understood, and then the more I read, I sort of was able to click in. But evangelical is a term that gets thrown around a lot, yeah. but it seems to have different meanings to different people. And how would you, how do you define an evangelical, what is an evangelical? Yeah, well, there's certainly been a, an evolution mm -hmm. with the definition over the past 50 or 60 years. It was well understood in the 60s, certainly in the 70s, to understand that this was a distinct subculture within American Protestantism, right. uh, where folks truly believed that uh, the Bible was the inspired word of God, that it was not just a collection of writings about God, but that, in fact, it was the word of God and that they had a responsibility then to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and to right. evangelize. That's right. the verb, right? Mm -hmm. I think what started to happen, certainly in the late 70s and then into the 80s in the moral majority era, is that the term began to take on more and more of a political connotation. Mm -hmm. And if you fast forward all the way to today, you know, for better or worse, and I, in my opinion it's for worse, yeah. the perception of what it means to be an evangelical is a conservative, white, Republican Trump supporter. And, and the damage done to the credibility of the witness for Jesus Christ is profound because of that. Anyone who does not fit into that box right. is now, uh, you know, they feel unwelcome and they feel, they feel uh, ostracized and, and sort of um, set aside by this movement. Right. And the ability to evangelize those people right. is now significantly diminished as a result. Mm. Well, okay. Tim, you and I both grew up in the evangelical church, and your story had so many parallels to my own. Um, you know, briefly, I had people who grew, I grew up with in the church who haven't spoken to me since I spoke out against Donald Trump, family members who think I walked away from the faith because I walked away from Donald Trump. Um, wow. You tell a very yeah. compelling story about after your father passed. Can you tell me, tell us that and what inspired you to write the book? Yeah, so I grew up as a, as a PK, a pastor's kid. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad was the, the leader of a pretty large evangelical church outside of Detroit where we grew up. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that my first book came out right when he died. And my first book, as you know, Alyssa, I, uh, I took, a, took a pretty hard look at a number of your former bosses, not just Donald <laughs> Trump. And, uh, and so when I went home for the funeral, then because the book was in the news and because I was getting beat up by right-wing media over the book, a lot of folks at the funeral were confrontational. They were oh. rather cold. They were uh, asking me if I was still a Christian yeah. because how could I be if I was criticizing Donald Trump? Oh. Um, and so it was very ugly, but it was also very eye-opening and, and, and I would say galvanizing because oh. I think it was a moment where a problem that had been sort of abstract, this radicalizing happening within the evangelical movement, which I had seen in my travels as a political reporter, suddenly it was now very concrete and, and really sort of threatening almost, yeah. feeling as though, listen, if my home church where I'd grown up since I was a toddler. And your father was the pastor. And my father was the pastor. Know him. Yeah. They, they know him. Know, right, they, they don't know Trump. Yeah, they know, me. They know him. Yeah. So if, if they're willing to treat me this way while he's in a box 50 feet away, yeah then how are they treating the rest of the world, mm, right? Exactly. And, that, and that's, that's the crisis that I decided I had to try to okay. tackle. So let, let's go here. How has he sinned? Let us count the ways. <laughs> Trump has paid off porn stars, bragged on tape about grabbing women by their genitalia. He's in court this week in a case involving, involving alleged rape. He calls his opponents vermin right out of the Nazi playbook. He incited a riot on the Capitol that left five people dead, and yet he's posting this ad and playing it at rallies. Watch. And on June 14th, 1946, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker. So God gave us Trump. God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, fix this country, work all day, fight the Marxists, eat supper, then go to the Oval Office and stay past midnight at a meeting of the heads of state. 
so God made Trump. Yes. Okay, can we say blasphemy? This is one of the most amoral and least religious men I have ever seen in politics, for sure. For, for sure. Remember 2 Corinthians? I thought that was... the Bible upside down. Upside down. <laughs> but he's the de facto poster boy uh, for these evangelicals that you're describing. I'm assuming not all of them are in for him, but the ones that you're talking about. Now, what am I missing? How do God-fearing people reconcile this with that? <laughs> okay, so <it's, laughs> there, there's a lot to unpack. Let, let me say this first and foremost. Um, that, that advertisement, yeah. that video that's now being played at Trump's <laughs> rallies, it is speaking directly to a belief system now yes. within the evangelical world w w yes. that Trump is yes. God's man, that God, he is chosen yes. for this moment, that yes. he is an agent of the Almighty. And, and the justification many people will use, Joy, is, well, listen, God used flawed characters throughout the Bible. Nobody was perfect, and yet he used them to advance his purposes. I, there are many theological problems with that, one of which being that most of those people, Moses, David, Peter, Paul, they all repented and they all had a heart that was after and God's Jesus own. And Jesus died for everyone. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So wait, what, so, so God chose him. He also chose Putin, Hitler, Himmler, Mussolini. I could name a few well, that he chose also and, according to this theory. And let me be clear about this. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the question that is uncomfortable for a lot of folks to answer, and, and I have friends and family members in this camp, and yeah. I want to be respectful when I say it. They, they believe that Trump was chosen for this moment to, to, to protect their yeah. kingdom here on earth. Mm -hmm. But have they entertained the possibility, at least the possibility, that Trump was actually chosen to test them in this moment? Yes. And to see, to see whether their beliefs, their convictions as followers of Christ can withstand yeah. this sort of testing of national idolatry, of, of political, uh, partisan identity that has taken them further and further away from Christ yeah. and, and turned Republican politics and Trumpism yeah. into, into an idol. Yeah. And into a power play, which was never about the power for the, the individual. It was always in the name of God. And, but um, at the Iowa caucuses earlier this week, Trump dominated with white evangelicals, garnering 53% of their vote. Um, now that's over 30 points higher than in 2016. Ron DeSantis had the endorsement of a hugely influential Iowa evangelical evangelical, uh, Bob Vanderplatz. Um, and Trump still got double DeSantis support. So there have been off ramps. There have been options that were other than Donald Trump. Why didn't evangelicals throw their weight behind DeSantis, Mike Pence, Tim Scott, people with like much more legitimate religious bona, f bona fides than Trump? It's, I mean, it's a great question. What we've seen here in the last eight years is, is an incredible arc from you know, back in 2016, it's, well, it's a binary choice. He's the lesser of two evils. I mean, the funny thing is, if you look at the Iowa results in 2016, Trump dominated among non-evangelicals, but really struggled with evangelicals. And that was actually the story of the entire primary. Trump won the nomination in spite of significant resistance from evangelicals. If you fast forward now eight years, many of these same people feel guilty about having ever doubted him. They view him as sort of a, a deliverer for yes. their community. And I think it really all boils down to this idea that these folks view their country, their Judeo-Christian idealized America as being under attack, that, tr that the barbarians are at the gates, and therefore they need a barbarian to protect them. That is, but that they is don't their... see him as a I, I have to say I'm Catholic, and, and I was so shook by that ad, so I'm still a little, a little out of sorts. But um, I, I thought that the evangelical vote was Trump's because he promised to get rid of Roe v. Wade. And I thought they were just one issue voters. I had no idea that they thought he was the Messiah. Mm -hmm. But, um, so this is shocking to me. So Trump's Supreme Court picks overturning Roe v. Wade after 50 years was really a massive win, I thought, for the evangelical uh, movement. But why would you stick with him after that? What is he promising in a potential second term to, to keep their support? You know. Well, let's, let's... I think I do, but I'm scared of the answer. Okay, let me, let me say two things. To, quickly, to the premise there, what's fascinating is that evangelicals put all their eggs in the political basket for 50 years to overturn Roe v. Yes. Wade, and they succeeded, and the result is more abortions in America. 
Which raises an interesting question, which is that if you believe as an evangelical that life is made in the image of God yes. and that therefore it deserves protection at every stage, that if you believe that to your core, that abortion is not a political issue, it is an ethical, moral, spiritual issue, yes. then why have you, why have you attempted to exercise raw political power yes. on Make that issue, uh, on that yes. issue, right? That, so, so I would say that first. Secondly, I would say now, if you understand the evangelical mindset, I grew up steeped in this rhetoric, this messaging, that the end is coming, that yes. we are approaching an yes. imminent, an Im, yes. an imminent, an imminent clash between the good, God-fearing, Bible-believing Christians and the secular, wicked, outside world, which is, by the way, when COVID-19 comes along mm -hmm. and you have blue state governors ordering churches to shut down, everybody says, well, here we are. The government's coming for us. We knew this day would come. Yeah. So there is a pervasive fear in the evangelical yeah. world that persecution is coming for them. The, the, the problem with that, there's a number of problems, but the, the key theological problem yeah. with that is that if you look at the founding of Christianity, Christianity has always operated from the margins. It has never yes. been about power. It has never been about needing right. to control the levers of the state. Or kingdoms in heaven, not on earth. Exactly. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, yeah. as he was being led to his execution. Yeah. Yeah. So you can turn, as a Christian, yeah. you have two choices yeah. in times of trouble. You can turn to the sword. You can turn to a political, military, strong man. You can try to co-opt the power of the state. Yeah. Or you can turn to the cross right. and you can walk in the path of Jesus and you can be faithful and gracious even to those who are threatening you, your perceived yes. enemies. Yes. And that is the fundamental divide now within the evangelical world. And, and, and if nothing else, I'm just hoping to remind people yeah. of what the path of Jesus looks like. Well, you sure did. I'm telling you, it, it, the book is an, it's a knockout. So yeah. our thanks to Tim Alberta, the book, The Kingdom, The Power, and The Glory is available now.